doke. Here we go. I'm starting to see people coming in. Hello, friends. I'm just giving it a few seconds. So get comfy, everybody. Grab your tea if you forgot it. <laughs> All righty. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and start talking. If you're coming in, welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, well, to our little virtual event space here. I'm Allie. I'll be hosting tonight, which is why I have my Britney Spears headset on. Um, if you are local, you might recognize me from the before times when I was in the bookstore every day. <laughs> um, and I am so excited to be introducing Ellie Alexander and Abby Collette here to discuss two of my favorite things, mystery and ice cream. Um, so before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to really quickly thank you all so much for tuning in and for buying books. Your guys' support really is what keeps us going and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, come on in. We're open. I think we're open until seven. Um, grab books. Or if you're not local, we do ship. Shipping is only $3.50 for the first book and then a dollar on top of that. And you get to support USPS too. So it's like a win-win. Um, I will be linking books in the chat. So they'll be really easy to find. Um, and while you are over on our website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events. We've got a really exciting schedule coming up in the new year. Um, maybe sign up for our newsletter. It is just a once a week update about everything that's going on in the bookstore, um, events that we've got coming out, books that are new releases that we're excited about, um, blog posts. We have fun on the blog and on social media. Uh, if you want to come check out our social media, we are at Third Place Books pretty much everywhere. Uh, we even have a TikTok. Come check it out. We have a good time. So there might be some good stuff for you. <laughs> um, so we are going to be here for about an hour. Uh, towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. So there is a chat and a Q&A. They are two different things. Um, I would love it if you guys would blow up the chat, talk to each other, connect, share your thoughts and feelings. We love to see that. Um, but for your questions, definitely, definitely throw those into the Q&A box so that when the time comes, we can find them. And it's not a disaster if you don't put them there, but it does make things much easier. And I'll just be keeping an eye on it, so don't worry. Um, and I think think that is all of the housekeeping that I have. So without further ado, Ellie Alexander is a Pacific Northwest native who bakes as much as she writes. She is the author of Sloan Cross. Is that correct? Kraus. Kraus. Kraus, my mistake. <laughs> uh, mysteries and bake shop mysteries, including Meet Your Baker and A Batter of life and death. Her newest book, Chilled to the Bone, is the 12th book in her bake shop mystery series and features a pop-up ice cream shop and a murdered performance artist called the Wizard of Ashland. Um, Abby Collette has written 25 books and short stories. She has hit both the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller lists. Her latest cozy series, An Ice Cream Parlor Mystery, is out now. And the second book in that series, A Game of Cones, which is an excellent title, comes out in March, so next month. <laughs> so thank you guys both so, so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. Uh, if you need anything, give me a call. I will be invisible, but listening. Um, and the rest of you have a great time. Uh, I'm going to leave you in their capable hands. Do not forget to throw your questions in the Q&A and I will see you soon. Thanks, Allie. That was so fun. <laughs> okay, so Abby, I have to say before we get into it, we um, have gotten to know each other through Zoom, of course, because of the pandemic. And um, I said, when my ice cream book comes out, we have to have an ice cream event together. So thank you for being here and being up past your bedtime. 
I'm happy to be here. So I, I'm going to have something propped up around me soon, just in case I start falling over. But I'm yeah. sure we'll be having too much fun. <laughs> I we love that we both have books about ice cream. That is just so awesome. I know. <laughs> okay. So my first question to you is because I devoured, a, a, I want to say inside deadly scoop every time, a deadly inside scoop. <laughs> I, do um, I say it wrong all the time. So, <laughs> And when your main character, your protagonist comes home to Ohio to open an ice cream shop, right? And I think that there might be some differences in styles of ice cream from Ashland, Oregon to Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Am I wrong about that? Let's find no, out. I believe you are correct. And what makes it even worse is that Chagrin Falls is a real place. It's where my story takes place. There are two ice cream shops in Chagrin Falls. So you would think you'd get more variety, but I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think we can match you. Let's find out. <laughs> so you know in the pacific northwest um you know there's this big foodie focus always and when i was doing research because my series obviously is bait shop so in this particular book in chill to the cone they're opening a pop-up ice cream shop but they can't call it ice cream it has to be called a concrete i didn't know what that was i didn't i was like concrete Right. But you told me. So tell them to tell them what a concrete is. Well, so a concrete is like almost like a silkier version, like a custard meets an ice cream. There's not supposed to be any icy flakes in it, which my question to you is, does that defeat the purpose if it's not icy? I think so. It has to be icy and creamy and mm, yummy. I don't know that it's not yummy, but just the word, Ellie, concrete. It conjures up something completely different, you know. Right. Maybe I don't think of ice cream when I yeah. when I say that word. <laughs> no. Um, so I did a deep dive into research when I was working on Chills of the Cone because I wanted to get that Northwest flavor. And I thought to start out, it would be fun if I give you a little quiz and okay. you guess which flavors are real and which of these I made up. Okay, are you game? Okay. Okay. I'm game. Okay. Okay. Um, bone marrow and smoked cherries. Oh my false. gosh. So I was just watching a cooking show earlier and they used bone marrow. And so I know it's kind of popular. I'm going to say, because it sounds so weird that that's real. Okay. That's a real you, are, you are correct. That's from a Portland ice cream shop. I hey. won't be adding that one though. If anyone's interested and you won't see that one in my <laughs> <laughs> Okay, how about this one? Fish sauce caramel with palm sugar. It's palm sugar. Oh, that, you know, I don't want that to be real. So I'm going with that. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> um, also real. Oh my gosh. Isn't that, I, I guess it's salty from the fish oil. And I don't know what it's like, slippery from the palm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um candy cap mushroom and port and what what's the second part of it port like port wine port, like wine yeah oh oh well i have wine ice cream uh, actually i have some with liqueur in it so oh, liqueur yeah mm -hmm. yeah so mm, i'm gonna say that one's real Correct. Yay. <laughs> um, how about beet and pear sorbet? Oh gosh. And could you imagine the color of that sorbet? <laughs> now when makes sorbets often and but she, she and it, they're always fruity. And I know there's like a big thing about beets, they're all healthy. And I know you guys out on the east coast, um, I mean on the west coast are health oriented. So I'm going to say yes. That one is a no. That one I made up. <laughs> Do you like beets? I, I don't. wonder how that would be. I don't either. Okay, this okay. is a true story. My best friend, uh, beets are big though. Like you find beets everywhere in, in Portland and Seattle on menus. My, my really good friend had just had a baby. And um, we went to lunch and she ordered a beet salad. 
And about an hour after we got home, she called me and she's like, Ellie, I'm dying. I've, I, I did it. Did you murder me? Like what happened at lunch? It was the beet salad. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't like beets. My sister used to eat them like it was candy. She'd get so excited if she was having beets and she loved pickled beets and beet salad. And I was just, I, I can't do it. And yeah, so that's good. I'm glad it's not because I don't have to worry about putting beets in ice cream. No, no, don't cream. put eat beets in ice cream. And I have to say, none of these, I could go on. There's there's, there's a much longer list, but we should talk other stuff. But um, <laughs> none of these actually go into the ice cream shop in my book either. It's okay. They take, I take like, you know, maybe it'd be, it would be like a balsamic, like a touch of something like that. But I don't, I don't think I want fish sauce in my ice cream. I don't either. I, I don't even get that. Who would think of that? Let's put fish in ice cream. Right. You know, <laughs> most times you don't even do dairy and, you know, people say cheese doesn't go, with, you know, won't go with fish. You don't even put the two together. So. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So that was some of the deep dive of research that I did. I would love to know what did you do in terms of research for your ice cream? Oh, I, 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 you may not want to hear this. I did such grueling research. I went to maybe <laughs> four or five ice cream stores and just ate all the ice cream, you know, that I saw. Of course, while I spoke with them about, you know, how they do things and um, um, how they keep their ice cream, how they make their ice cream. And I even took my kids, my grandkids rather, uh, out to Chagrin Falls and we just ate so much ice cream. And then, but while we were doing it, we sat outside and we talked to a lot of the locals and they told me where to go. So it was hard research, you know, and I probably I'll have to do it again for, you know, other books, but what are you going to do? You got to research if you're going to write a book, right? You do. And you want to get the ice cream, right? That's the, the you want to get the ice cream, right? But to be honest, because I'm all the way over here in Ohio um, and we um, have snow, we still have ice cream at uh, stores. They're still open in the winter. We still have long lines when you go inside, but we don't have like the flavors and things like you were talking about. So another part of my research, I had to get on the internet to look up flavors and flavor combinations. And I'll be honest with you, the most of the flavors that I get um, that are different, I got from um, ice cream shops that were on the West Coast. <laughs> uh, it would say I went through one that was like 50 flavors from all 50, you know, one flavor from every state. Um, and all the ones that I liked and I thought these are doable, um, was that were out west. So okay, so our, our crazy foodies we represent when it comes. Okay, good to yes. know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely represents. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> And ice cream research is not such a bad thing. Let's be honest. Oh, okay. I just like to say that so people won't know how much fun I had. <laughs> <laughs> My granddaughter did complain, the youngest one. She was about maybe about eight or nine. She goes, Grammy, we were buying so much ice cream. I go, are we complaining? She said, no, I just, no. <laughs> she just thought maybe she should say something about eating so much ice cream. It's okay. I won't tell your parents. So. Right, right. Yeah. Come on, embrace it. I love it. Right. <laughs> okay, so um, in my books, they all have recipes in the back. And I did not attempt to make a concrete myself for this book. I created like a fun shake. And then Jules is in the kitchen just baking so much, you know, food is pervasive and part of the background of, of the story. So did you try your hand at actually making ice cream? Because that's like, that's next level. That is next level. And I've seen your videos. They are just awesome. I can't, I was just thinking, I can't wait for the ice cream videos because maybe I'll learn something. Um, <laughs> nope. I definitely want to see this concrete one. Um, so, um, Yes, I make ice cream for the kids. I don't get real fancy. Like I have one that's a, a chocolate cherry um, armoretto liqueur thing. I, I didn't try that one because I don't drink and I was afraid of putting too much in. And my tasters are, you know, all under the age of like 15. So, right, <laughs> kind know. of problematic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the um, pumpkin spice and... Um, snow ice cream I had when we were little. So in the book, she makes snow ice cream. So I did that. And um, 
uh, I, there's one more flavor. Oh, caramel corn. And, and that popcorn, one, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, popcorn. And when I was a little girl, I, my mother used to do this. Um, she, when she'd get, corn, she'd always get corn on the cob back in those days. You didn't buy canned stuff and frozen stuff. And when she would scrape the, uh, cut the corn off, she would always give it a twist um, and get the juice out of the cob. And so that's sort of what this one is. So I, that's one of my favorite ones. I did try that one because it reminded me of my mother watching her cook when I was a little girl. So I, I enjoyed uh, doing that. But I don't remember many flavors. Now you talked about, oh my gosh, such yummy stuff in your book um, in the bakery and torts. And then you talked about the concrete and stuff. What flavors are, are you having in your um, ice cream? And I want to ask you too about the name of your ice cream, but what flavors are you thinking about having serving in your little pop-up? In the pop-up, they're serving lots of like, you know, um, salted caramel with like sea salt and some dark chocolate and Oregon oh. Marion berry and like really fresh, um, you know, beautiful, luscious concrete. Cool. <laughs> what made you come up with putting concrete? Did you do research for that? I did, did yeah. With- have you ever had concrete ice cream? I have, yeah. Like all of those flavors that I was telling you about at the yeah. beginning, they all come in like concrete. So that's like the, the terminology. I know, isn't that funny? Yeah, I tried to look it up. I don't think we do that out here, but you know, the West Coast is always first. They do things first and then it moves <laughs> slowly across the country. Except for fish sauce. We're going to have to ask readers at the end if everybody, if anyone would be willing to try the fish sauce and caramel with palm sugar. I don't know. Okay, because we talk about food so much in our books. I'm always interested, and I'll tell you mine, and then I want to hear yours. Uh, like, what three things will you always find in your refrigerator? Mine, I think, are surprising because I think people think that I write this bake shop mystery and everything would be baking related, but in my refrigerator, you will always find hummus. Oh, I love hummus. I could live on hummus. You'll always find hummus. You will always find cream because I need a splash of cream in my coffee every morning. And you will always find pears. Pears? They're not even always in season, are they? You know, we here in Ashland, we have Harry and David, which is like one of the biggest producers of pears in the world. The the Rogue Valley is like prime pear growing region. Royal Riviera pears. I'm going to send you some. They're like, they're, they're like eating sugar. They're so sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, and my book is not about baking. It's about ice cream, but in my refrigerator, you will always find things to bake. I always have milk. (laughs) I always have butter and margarine and I always have eggs and I'm not even a big egg fan. I had to teach myself to like eggs because you know, they're good for you. Uh, Boiled eggs. I I have always loved, but I always have those things. And basically it's because when I do cook, I I rarely bake. I'm just not as talented. Um, I make everything from scratch. So, you know, I need all those things. I don't, I don't so much buy canned this and frozen that. Um, so I have to have those things. I always have flour and sugar, but those aren't in the refrigerator. Right. <laughs> those, are all, those are the only things I can think of that I always have. And they're for baking, you know, that's what you use. So you could always come to my house and bake a cake, Ellie, or bake whatever you do. <laughs> I'd have the ingredients for you. Now, do you okay. make your hummus or do, do you buy it? I you make do? it. Yeah. Yummy. Oh, you. I want that recipe. Okay. That's awesome. I'll send it. Yeah. Yeah. You had, you had some good recipes. Um, I'm definitely going to try in your uh, book, the one for the um, engagement pasta or proposal, proposal proposal chicken. chicken. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to make that. You always have such great recipes in there. I'm going to definitely try that. Now I had a question about the name of your um, pop-up. You you ended up with scoops, but um, your character just popped up all these names you know off the top of their heads or we can name it this or we can name it that and I have the hardest time naming anything um I have a new series of I don't know when it's coming out but I just turned the book into my editor and um the it's a book book shop 
and a soul food cafe. And I could not come up with a name. So halfway through the manuscript, it's called One Thing. And then I thought of some more names. So I put those in later in there. So <laughs> I had to make a note to my editor because I didn't go back and change it because I didn't know which one I liked. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So when you see that, it's really the same place. It's just a bunch of names. How did you, how do you come up with your names? Do they really just roll off like your characters, um, Juliet uh, came? you know, like she thought of them or do you struggle with coming up with those funny no, names? They always roll off my tongue. I, I think I, I like dream in puns anymore, um, <laughs> but I'm like, I will then I'll come up with too many. And so then I'm like, oh, I like them all. I want them to be all. Um, so I think that's where I get stuck more is deciding on what. Maybe. I can never think of them. I love scoops. I was happy that um, she picked Scoops because I liked that one the best. I liked the other two, but Scoops just sounded fun. And I have a question, another question, because I am so confused <laughs> with this open pop-up, open air pop-up, because aren't you afraid that, and it happens, you know, if you guys have read this book and you should, if you haven't, because it's so much fun um, to, to go and start this new pop-up and come up with all these ideas. Um, that people don't go and vandalize. I don't want to give the story away, but I would worry that um, because it's just there, you have your counter, your refrigerator is just all open. Does are do you really have those things in um in Ashland where you can just leave it overnight and come back the next morning and you still have a kitchen there and it's still standing? <laughs> it's true. So it's based on a real place in Ashland that is. Wow. Yeah, a summer ice cream shop. It was a Hawaiian barbecue place for a little while, which is why I added the Hawaiian barbecue truck in the book. Um, yeah. But it really is. It genuinely is. Now, Ashland is only 20,000 people, though. So it's a really, it's a small town. And people think Oregon, you know, I we did have snow this morning, although not snow like you had snow. Yeah. Um, we had like two inches this morning. But Ashland is right on the border between Oregon and California. So it's, it's one of the sunniest places in Oregon too. We get more sun than probably anywhere else in the state, I think. And so you can have a pop-up shop that's open from probably like March until early November too. So that helps. Yeah, that was just amazing to me. That could never happen in Cleveland. Not so um, much. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. And especially because we have like 11 months of winter, you know, it's, right. it's, it's not as bad as say, you know, if we lived in Minnesota, but it's just crazy. And, you know, it'll snow. Um, uh, there's been snow in June and it's usually snow all the way through to April. And, but then we'll have 66 degree weather December, you know, in December. Um, and then it'll snow, you know, when it's supposed to be spring. Uh, so that's one reason, but um, I just thought, what do you do with all the food at night? And uh, do you put a lock on the refrigerator or do you share your food with, because you talked about, and I like this, we both talk about serious subjects in our book. You talked about the homeless population in your book. Um, and it, it seems like Ashland, uh, it, they really look out for homeless people and those less fortunate. Uh, and I know you base your, your, your story and your setting on a real place. So I just imagine that was true that they help out, but there is still, you know, you can't help everyone and they're still homeless. Um, what happens then? Do they go and grab the food or what do you do? Right, yeah, it's true. Um, I think, you know, obviously you just lock it at night, but, and um, it's interesting because Ashland kind of has two different populations. There are, there's this group that are like travelers who are by choice. They kind of go up and down the West Coast following the weather and the, a lot of times it's younger students. It's kind of like Reese, um, not Reese, <laughs> Reese Witherspoon was wild. It's like Cheryl Strayed's wild. You know, there's like this whole crew of kind of vagabond personalities. And then there are also truly people who are unhoused. And so there's that balance. And I'm glad you brought it up because I think it's one of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight too. I personally feel like, yes, of course, we're writing a, dead light, a deadly inside scoop and chill to the cone. But when I read, even if I'm reading something that's light and fun, 
I want kind of that real world to ground me. And I like being able to add in some depth. And that's one of the reasons that I devoured your first book and I can't wait for a game of cones to come out um, because there are these other issues that we weave in and Alzheimer's obviously plays a role in your books as well. So like, did you make a conscious choice to do that? Well, my father had Alzheimer's. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I find that um, after I write a book, people will, readers will point out, you know, things that I do like that. And I don't think that I do it consciously. It's just part of me, like mm -hmm. my new book um, and, a, and another series that I wrote, um, a part, there's kinship adoption. And then there's um, in, a, in a newer book I'm writing, there's adoption. And that was a big part of my family. So I think those things are just like ingrained in me. And, you know, you know, the old adage from Mark Twain, you write what you know. You know, so those are things I know that are just, I guess, a part of me. And people often tell me, you know, when I read your books, Abby, it's just like talking to you. You know, I can hear your voice. So I think not only is my voice there, but um, me, you know, is, is there too. And those, all those things were part of me. Like in your, um, in this book, uh, Chill to the Cone, you have the wizard in there. And he suffers with a mental illness. And when I read that, I go, oh my gosh, because my next book that's coming out, A Game of Cones, um, which is out in, you know, as said in March, I also have someone who's suffering from mental illness and he's kind of on the street. He's missing a lot of his teeth. Um, and he, he had a life before, just like the wizard. And, you know, people um, are just coming to realize about mental health issues that it's not taboo, that yeah. those people should just get a grip on it, that it's a, a disease, you know, and that um, that you just can't get over it. Um, so I like that when I saw that, I thought, oh, this is the guy in my book is Miles. Um, his name is Miles. And uh, he's so much like the wizard, you know, and people look out for him. So I like that we matched in that without even knowing. So I think I thought that was pretty cool. Or yeah. kindred spirits. I do. Yeah. I feel like <laughs> our job as writers is to reflect the world around us. And yes, I agree. Um, we can't not take those parts of ourselves out. And I, I feel the same too, in terms of um, my, my Sloan Krauss series that's set in Leavenworth, which is not far from Seattle. That can be part of your research for the soul food series. Um, my main character Sloan has grown up in the foster care system. And I spent all of my early career working with families who were part of the foster care system. And so I think it's like these experiences, they seep into us. And then whether we realize it or not, they come out in the writing. I agree with that. And I like that. I like that I don't plan it, but that it comes, you know, it comes out in the story and it speaks to people, you know, and people can relate to that. That's the way you make the stories that we write believable. And you have such a deft hand at doing that because, um, and I know it's because of where you live and you're writing where you live, but it's, it's not as easy as people think to put that on the page, but you show all those things, the community and the uh, neighborly, how people are neighbor, neighborly and they look out for each other. And then the real world issues in, in this book, you've got, you know, um, people are trying to decide if they're going to stay together or not, even though they love each other. They, sometimes that's not all it takes, you know, to make that to make that go at being married and staying married. Um, so those are all good things to ground your story. Um, you still have the fun of the murder and we definitely don't want that to be real world where every time we put right. out books, you put out, you put out 12, you don't want 12 murders <laughs> right. in this little town of 20,000 people. And, and I don't know how long you're going to go on, but you know, so uh, other than that, you know, it's always a great place to live and, and then to learn too. Um, so I appreciated those things. And then it was all about love. It was a lot of couples in there and different kinds of culture, cu couples. And it's exactly what you see, you know, in your neighborhood, in your family. So I enjoy right. it. I like that. And I yeah. think, um, I think we need that in our, in our books right now, you know, um, that sense of connection and community. And um, that's one of the things that really resonated with me in terms of Wynn too, because she's coming into a new place and she's trying to find family and make those connections and see, you know, kind of where her role is in the community. Yeah. And she gets kind of, kind of upset because in the second book, 
her aunt Jack comes back and she had managed the store before. She met a guy on the internet and she took off after him. I went to North, North Carolina, I think. And now she's back and she's wanting to change everything. And it makes Wynn a little insecure. So she has to deal with that at the same time that there's a murder and also a friend uh, from where she used to work in New York comes to try to woo her back to New York to get her away from the family business mm -hmm. and back to uh, the ad agency. Uh, she comes with more money, a big promotion and all the things, you know, analytical win likes, but um, of course family comes first. So. Ice cream. She can't leave the ice cream. Who can leave ice cream? <laughs> Who can leave ice cream? Come on, she's just getting started. <laughs> what made you decide to do a pop-up store? I, those are so, so now, you know, people are doing those. Um, is that where you got the idea? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the funny thing, and I don't know if this is true for you, but um, in writing about a family-owned business, I'm constantly wanting Juliet to grow and everything, but now she's she's got a lot going on. She's got the bake shop. She has a partial ownership in a winery, and now she has the pop-up. But that's actually really true for Ashland too. Ashland is a really big restaurant kind of city because we have the Oregon Shakespeare Festival here. Sadly, that's not happening right now. But in usually in um, the summer months, you know, downtown is booming. You're getting like hundreds of thousands of tourists in to see plays. And so there are really a handful of people who own multiple restaurants and I will see them running around town. And I thought, oh, that's just another way to get her into a different part. Um, but I am always, I, I wonder, because readers will be like, how is she managing so many places at once? <laughs> well, she has great help. I like that you've written, um, you know, a lot of help into the story. And then Carlos, her husband, runs the vineyard. Is Are there a lot of vineyards around too? There yeah. are, yes, yes. So this is like, it's kind of like the pairs. Vineyards are all throughout the Rogue Valley. Wow. Um, and actually, I would have never thought that about Oregon. You know, you get in your head, I, I think it's California, you know? And so that's right. that's something cool to, to know, yeah. What about when, do you think she's gonna hire more help eventually, especially if she's off solving murders? I know. And, you know, I tried to get the shop to be opened, like, just not real early and not real late. And my editor said, well, I called Cleveland and the, all the ice cream stop, shops, they open to 11. I thought, oh, no. oh my God, <laughs> when is she ever, when, when will she, she ever can't. find time <laughs> yeah. to solve a crime if she has to work till 11? <laughs> so actually, um, so I've already, I've written, I've written uh, three books already, like last year. I I was so excited about uh, the story and ice cream shop. And I think all that sugar from my research, you know, yeah. really got me to go. go. So I've written all book, all three books. And yes, um, so, so far there's Candy and Wilhelmina. And then I, um, Love Wilhelmina. yeah, she, <laughs> she gets a, um, a food truck. It's um, being made in the second book and then she'll have it in the third book. So she actually hires uh, more people then because now she's got this food truck. And in Cleveland, we have Walnut Wednesday, it's called. Um, food trucks gather on a street downtown called Walnut and they all line up. And they prob they probably branched out now. This is when it first started and when food trucks were just getting popular. So she goes down there. So certainly she has to, to have some help. And then her parents, I mean, you know, her family rather, not her father. Uh, her, her family pops in and helps her brother sometimes. Uh, definitely her mother and her friends, Maisie now works there full time. She quit her job um, at the restaurant. So yes, uh, and initially I hadn't put, put anyone in there and my editor, after she discovered, I had to leave it open to 11 o'clock said, you need help, so yeah. <laughs> How dare your editor call Cleveland? <laughs> That's so unfair. I would, I would have never thought that. Or I would have thought, she lives in New York, I would have thought, she check out the local ice cream. Right. She called Cleveland. I, and yeah, I, I could just imagine that. that conversation. What time do you close? Right. <laughs> no. Right. So, Although that is yeah. going to give her the possibility of being out late at night where more nefarious things could be happening. That's good. That's I, yeah. And that's when she finds the body in um, a deadly inside scoop. It's night. You know, it's a lot of snow out. It's dark out. 
um, falls. Just, uh, yeah, by the falls. And so, uh, yeah, so things can happen at night. But I've yet to see wind stay all the way till 11 o'clock, I think. I'll have to write that in. I don't know that she ever closes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that would be yeah, and that would be kind of hard because she's there at five o'clock making ice cream, 5 right. a.m. So yeah. yeah. Well, we just our sleuths can't sleep. We have to, I mean, the thing <laughs> is, I what I think is funny is, you know, readers will probably be like, well, how can Wendy there at 11 or why is Jules up at 3 a.m.? But then you can see that there's a body. So right. you know, it's somewhere right. is a body. Yeah. But they're millennials. Both of them are millennials. Right. So yeah. they have lots of energy. They're young. They've got time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no kids. No kids. And Wynn doesn't even have a boyfriend, let alone a husband. But it seems to me that um carlos keeps her you know feeling probably even younger than than she is <laughs> that's right so, you know <laughs> exactly. love always makes you feel youthful you know? <laughs> love does make you feel youthful it's yeah. so funny i wrote this book before the pandemic like you're saying because you know we're always writing ahead of schedule um and i was so glad that there was kind of this love theme that came through um which is just yeah. ironic isn't it yeah because i was kind of getting upset with jules because i was like he doesn't no, sound like he's leaving. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't let him leave. He was always saying future stuff, you know, like we'll have to do this and we will get used to doing this. And I was like, he wants to say, I just wanted to tell him he wants to say, don't worry. It seems like he wants Come to Come on, say. find love. Do you think Wynn yeah. is going to find love? So funny because I put O in there. There's a law um, professor uh, and I gave him the nickname O, oh. and he likes he likes Win. And everyone yeah. can tell her mother is always saying, "Oh, he's nice. He likes you." Her friends are saying, "Go after him." And Win just doesn't like him. And it's so funny because I try on my keyboard to try for Win to like him, and she never wants to. So <laughs> she just resists every time I try to get them to dinner or to go out together somewhere she resists but funny in the third book um that I, I wrote for this series she i put in a subplot and um and i did, didn't decide to put the subplot in until the very end and i thought well i can't just introduce it now so i went back to the beginning and put a little something in and then i thought well i could tie it in in the middle and in the middle i put a guy he's a doctor like her father and he came to the shop and she came out and saw him and she couldn't speak. She was just flabbergasted and she just, you know, couldn't talk and was uh, flustered. And I thought, oh, you okay. like him? Yeah. yeah, she just kind of took over. And I guess she said, okay, this one I can like. I <laughs> didn't even know that was coming, you know? I love, I love it when characters take over and do their own thing. Me too. You know, before I started writing, I would go to things like this and hear other writers talk and they would say that that happened. And in my head, I was like, that doesn't happen. And now you're like, oh, no, that happens. That happens. That's why I'm a, a pantser instead of a plotter. I don't do outlines or anything. I just need the basic framework of what's going to happen. And then I kind of wind my characters up and set them down in the setting, whatever setting, you know, for that scene that I give them. And I just let them go, you know, what would you, what are you going to say next? I, I type one thing, the idea I have, and they just talk through it and get through it on their own. So that's fun. I like that. It's so fun. I know. And then you get to inhabit this world where you're like, what is going to happen next? <laughs> <laughs> I know what's going to happen next. Ooh. What will happen? I don't know. We don't know. The, the only <laughs> thing we can be sure of is that there will be a dead body. There will always be a dead body. We know for sure. Right. There will always be a dead body. Sometimes more than one. Sometimes more than I have, one. I, yeah, I have yet to write a book with more than one dead body. I don't think. I can't remember. Have you ever had more than I have had one where um, Jules was solving a mystery in present day. And then there was like an old skull from a previous like hundred year old murder. Um, and it was a good challenge for my brain, but <laughs> I was like, wait, that's which murder so are we on? Funny. Yeah, that's so funny you said that because I don't want you to think I cheated and listened to that or that I read that book, but that was my, that's my proposal for the fourth book. That, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, that they, they're going to solve. I have um, 
a person in the book can be uh, one of the people that I said help out. And we haven't had much said about her, but I'm going to make her, uh, she's a foster child because her murder, her mother was murdered. And I was thinking they could go back and, you know, solve that one oh, yeah. at the same time, uh, another murder happened. So I'll have to not read that book. Uh, oh, totally no, this, this book, this, that, that happened in Live and Let Pie, which I think was the, now I, they all blend together. That was the ninth. <laughs> and this was also based on real life. There's a lake called Emigrant Lake here in Ashland. And we've had such bad droughts that the lake has really dried up in the summers. And they found a town that was buried under the lake. They, they made a dam and they flooded this old town. And there were two young girls swimming one summer when the water level was really low and they dove down and found a gumball. And so instead of a gumball, I had them find a head, a skull. <laughs> Like you. You should have seen your face when you said that. That's kind of scary. Ellie. I know. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we should probably call Allie in to um Yeah, to some answer questions. some questions. <laughs> yeah. I see we have a few questions. So that's cool. <laughs> back. Hello. Hi. Hello. Okay, so let's see here. So someone is asking, are the mysteries standalone books or should they be read in order? well for me I'll go first because I only have two books in that series I have other books other series I always try to make my books stand alone so any book that you read by me I also write as Abby Vandiver Abby L Vandiver any book that you pick up of mine you should be able to 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 be okay and know what's going on so if it's the sixth book or the third book or the first book you should be fine Yes, absolutely. All of mine stand alone too. We always close out the actual murder. But as a reader myself of series, I always recommend starting at the first book because you're going to see so much growth in these characters over time. Um, and you're going to learn a little bit more backstory, but you can definitely start anywhere. And I'm always intrigued by readers who want to pick up something in the middle of the series. Um, and I'll, I'll hear from readers who were like, oh, I, I picked it up at book nine and I'm loving it. So that's always interesting to me. I can vouch, certainly vouch for that because um, I think I read maybe one book one and two, and then I read this one, the last one, which I just found out was the twelfth one, and I was, I was like, oh, they're married and and they're together, and but I still knew everyone, you know, and I still got it. It was like the soap operas; you could not watch right. the soap operas that's for right. three years and come back totally. <laughs> and know everything that's going on. So yeah, so your books definitely, even the twelfth one in. You don't That's have to awesome. worry about it. But start at the beginning, I think, for both of us. Start at the yeah, beginning. yeah, because wind's going to grow and change and you're going to meet this whole cast. And yeah, but yes, you can you can dive into the middle. Be a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> so another uh, anonymous attendee would like to know, what are you currently reading? Ooh, besides Ellie? I love that <laughs> question too. <laughs> because I'm trying to write a uh, women's fiction, I'm I'm reading this Halsey Halsey Street. Street. Yeah, it and it's a good book. But I I'm also um I think maybe we talked about this a little earlier. Uh, learning as I read, so I'm not only reading as a reader, I'm reading as a writer to learn. Uh, because women's fiction is a is a lot different from cozy mysteries. Um, different kind of vibe, I think, uh, different language, um, but I'm really enjoying it. And uh, it's amazing how you can not say much, and but say so much. So I'm enjoying that book. And that's I, by Emma Coster. Oh, I was just gonna start. say, what's, what's her name? I, I'm always bad at um, remembering author's names sometimes, where yeah. I'll remember the book title. I just had to look it up real quick. <laughs> So I just finished reading Miss Benson's Beetle, and I cannot recommend this read more. It's by Rachel Joyce. It is the sweetest book set post-war in England with this very frumpy um, main character who goes on this quest to find a beetle. And really it's um, a story of female friendship. It's a little bit like Up, but with two women um, and they go um, 
on this trek. It's just, it's incredible. And it's joyful and comforting and it's women's fiction too. I'm going to write that one down. That sounds good. It's lovely. It's a gem of a book. Yeah. Didn't, isn't that the author of Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold yes. Fry? Uh -huh. Yes. So if anyone in there remembers the Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry, good stuff. Yeah. Um, so let's see. We have someone asking, how long does it take to write your books? For me, um, it takes about three weeks for me to write a book. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as I know like who was killed, who the killer was, and I, I like to come up with five suspects. I always have to have names because that makes my characters real. Um, I, I can just go for it. And I write better under pressure. So <laughs> even if I have a long time to write a book, I always wait until I have like two or three weeks left. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I'm the opposite. I, I write, uh, cause I'm really structured in my writing. I, when I started writing, my son, who's going to be 17 in a few weeks, um, was in elementary school. And so I had this like finite chunk of time. So I still kind of write in those same hours. So I set daily word count goals. So I write 2000 words every day, which gets me a really terrible draft first draft in like six weeks. And then I'll set it aside and I'll go do research or taste ice cream, <laughs> whatever it is. And then I'll come back and do like three or four rounds of editing. And that usually takes me another couple months. So three weeks, Abby. Oh my gosh. No wonder Wynn doesn't sleep. She can stay up until 11. No problem. <laughs> well, I don't do drafts. So that's probably why. Whatever I write, it stays there. I will go back and read the chapter. Like maybe. Um, I, I have a writing partner. She'll go read chapter with me to make sure I'm not missing any words. But once she, we go back and we read it, I never look at it again. That's so. Crazy. Yeah, what's ever in it or not in it, <laughs> it's just there. Because when I get to the end, that's the end. <laughs> done. So, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> I can't read my own books. I don't know. <laughs> I get that. I am in absolute awe. Okay. <laughs> so Jamie is asking, what's the most unusual flavor of ice cream you've Fish, oh. the fish oil that we've ever eaten or just that we haven't tried yeah just the <laughs> i about. think it's we're not one trying that one Ali. we're not <laughs> trying that one please don't take me to that place when i come <laughs> when you come for your research trip we're hitting concretes first abby all the way <laughs> okay sounds good sounds um good. let's think i had a gorgonzola pear ice cream and it was delicious Oh, and I also had an avocado ice cream. That was really good. Oh. Yeah. I bet that is because that's already nice and smooth. And yeah. Um, so I don't do weird. I do chocolate. <laughs> um, I just do chocolate ice cream. And if I travel, I just eat chicken because either one of those things you kind of can't go wrong. Although I went to Dominican Republic before and they didn't know how to do chocolate. Although it was growing on the trees. I, that's probably why because I ate it there. Um, but yeah, and if you put some almonds in it, then I'm really good. I have tasted my granddaughter. She likes paintball oh. and ice cream and Superman ice cream. And they look exactly the same to me. So I don't know what the difference is, but there are a lot of different colors mixed together. And well, I didn't like that. So yeah, just give me that's chocolate. like too sweet, right? <laughs> yeah, just give me chocolate. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that avocado or pear gorgonzola were my go-to ice cream. <laughs> I, I would, I, I'm a chocolate all the way. Like, I'm with you. Can't go wrong with chocolate. Go wrong with chocolate. Or the question is, is it chocolate with a scoop of vanilla or is it just straight chocolate? Well, sometimes I get daring and I'll do the chocolate almond on the bottom and I'll do uh, chocolate chip, not mint top chocolate chip, just regular chocolate chip on top. But... You know, I have to kind of be like, oh, I want to do something different. I'm feeling fancy today. <laughs> <Living on the laughs> edge. Yeah, I'm feeling fancy. <laughs> so. so we've kind of touched on our last two questions here. Jamie is asking, what is your writing routine like? And someone else is asking, what is your writing style and do you plot? And we've kind of talked about this already, but is there anything that you would want to add about your, your style or routine? 
Well, for me, I, I am a bad person to ask that because I have no style. As you see, I, I'm a procrastinator. I wait till last minute to even write the book. Um, I like to listen to music. A lot of people have told me they don't know how I do that. I need noise in the background. So TV or music. And I don't like just um, instrumental. I need something with words. And lots of times those words just in the song pop in my ear and I type them into my book. They just fit right in whatever they're saying. Um I write on backs of envelopes and the back of receipts. So I, I'm usually cluttered because I got to find that envelope I wrote on because that was a great scene I thought of, you know, at that time. Um, sometimes while I'm driving, I talk into my phone, some idea that, I, that I've had. And then I always have chapter one. And then all my chapters after that are, I, I title them chapter next because I write just whatever I'm thinking about. And in the end, I may have to like, change the chapters around um, or add chapters in between. So I never know what number they are. So I'm really just out there and all over the place. And, you know, if someone said, you know, I want to, I want to write like you, you know, how do you write? I would tell them, don't ever do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> do, do what, don't do what I do. Don't do it. You may never get a book written. I don't know how I managed to do it. <laughs> But they, they're brilliant. So clearly have a process that works for you. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't know how that works though. It just, it just happens. You know, God is there helping. You, <laughs> yeah. You're channeling something. Um, I'm the, I, I would say, you know, I already talked, so I have a word count. I think word count, if, if you're, if it's somebody, someone who's thinking of writing is way more helpful than like a time limit because you can get too stuck in time and not, you could, say I wrote for three hours and not write a single word, right? Um, but I, I think um, one thing that I do pretty religiously after I finish a draft is I think of editing like layering. I come back through drafts and I, I, do, I do a people layer where it's like, how are people moving and what would they really be saying and thinking? And then I do a location layer where I really want to bring you into Ashland. So I'll go outside and I'll take pictures. I listen to music too. I have playlists for all of my characters. So um, Jules has a lot of like sad romantic songs on her playlist, but that helps me get in that space. And then food is always my last layer. So then I will go up to the kitchen and I'll actually like bake what I think might make a final cut of the book. I'll bake it two or three times and I'll think about like, what are my hands doing? How does it smell? I'll taste it. So I, I like that like sensory process. You put a lot of that in there. Um, I, I, I like that. It uh, really puts you, gives you a sense of place um, and, you know, includes your senses. And that's, I think, important. So what's your first draft though? What's that first draft like? Is it the, just the story? Pretty just much the story. story? Yeah, it's oh, terrible. That's no one should read it. Which is why I can't believe you can just write one draft and never look at it. My, if you read my first draft, you might think I'm a kindergartner. Like, no. <laughs> he sat. He talked. <laughs> well, you know, when I was in law school, I used to, I was a, um, a teacher's assistant for legal research and writing. And people would try to write all this fluffy stuff. And I had to look at people's papers and, you know, help, help them out before they turn it in. And I would always just say, you know, and they would, ex I would say, what does this mean? I don't understand. And they explain it to me. I go, well, just write it just like you say it. And that's what people say about me. They can hear my voice. They can hear mm -hmm. me talking. So I think, um, you know, when you talk, you don't usually go back and change it. You say whatever comes out. And so right. that's my book. It's me talking, <laughs> just whatever comes out. That's it. So. I love that. That's brilliant. <laughs> There is, oh, I'm reappearing here. There is nothing I love more than listening to authors talk about their writing process. I love it. <laughs> um, so I had a question. And if anyone else has questions, keep them coming. We have, <laughs> we have a few more minutes. We have time for a couple more. Um, but I had a question about, so you write mysteries um, and, and they're cozy, but there very much is murder in these books. So what is the more fun thing for you guys to write? Is it the murder or is it the coziness <laughs> or are they linked? Are they, can you not pull them apart? <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's a good question. I think, 
I think because I started with um, the mystery, that the mystery, like it drives the whole plot forward. So from like a technical writing standpoint, the mystery is easier for me to write because I've all, we have the body and then we've got the suspects and we have to figure out the connections and what they're all hiding and lying. And we gotta, we have to constantly be shifting suspicion. But I would say I enjoy writing the everything else more like that idea of the community and the village and and that's just so core to who I am that I think that piece is where like you see more of me on the page I think that I like the mystery but of course in a cozy you can't have a mystery without the murder but for me it's opposite it's hard for me to come up with the clues sometimes you know I'm writing the book and I think how are they going to figure this out I don't know that mentally I'm I, write it to make it more difficult for myself. I come up with all these fantastic ideas. And then I think, now how, how can you figure that, that out? <laughs> right. So sometimes I have to go and write the end of the book and write down, you know, as they explain um, how they were caught, you know, all, all, the, all the things that they used to catch them. And then I th think, oh, so I got to put this in somewhere as a clue, you know, that they saw this or they... Uh, picked up this because sometimes it's just hard to connect those dots um, so it's harder for me to do that it's always easy um, except for uh, this the last book the third book in the series which of course I don't know when that'll be out I, I remember I was in a bookstore and some and I was on the phone and I was complaining because I had two weeks left to you know write this book um, that I'd known I, I had to write for like a year <laughs> Wait until two weeks. And I, I was saying, she just won't die. And everyone in the bookstore <laughs> <they're> like, <laughs> it was like, I could not kill this girl. She just kept walking and talking. And then, you know, um, I think it was maybe chapter three before she actually killed over. So, but for the most part, it's easy for me to get um to to do the murder part. It's hard for me to do the clue part. <laughs> and um if if you're in seattle for a research trip um third place books will not need to worry uh, if you're like she just won't die she just won't die <laughs> good because otherwise you'd have to come and bail me out that's right I, I definitely. listen if i overheard that that would be the best thing that happened to me all day in the <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I think we're at like probably one more question. So this is the question that I always like to close with is what's coming next? What, what should we look out for in the future from you guys? Lots more books, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, um, uh, you know, the book coming out next month. Uh, for a daily inside scoop and then I have a new series that's going to come out um, it was just announced uh, a couple is it a couple weeks now uh, from Penguin but I'm not sure when it'll come out and it's a cozy mystery and then I have a woman's fiction uh, called Where Wild Peaches Grow and it will be published by Lake Union in August I think of 2022. And in between that, um, I have, I'm a hybrid author. I have some, I have self-published lots of books. I hope to maybe self-publish a series um, just to get back into that because I haven't done that in a while. So um, more books, look out for more books. Such good stuff. And your new series is going to be set in the Pacific Northwest. Your soul yes. series. Yes, yes. I'm excited about that. I really am. Because so once we can travel again, you need to come out for a research trip. I'm we'll definitely coming out. You, yeah. I'm, you guys record this, I hope, because when I'm knocking on her door, I want to be able to show her this, uh, yeah. Ellie, this video and say, it. you right. said I could come. Yes, you can come <laughs> stay with me. Uh, let's see, same for me. Um, the 13th book in the Big Shop Mysteries, Mocha, wow. she wrote. <laughs> yes, I love that title. <laughs> so good. Uh, I did not come up with that one. My editor did. So that, that I can't even take credit for that. Um, Mocha she wrote comes out in June. And then the fifth book in the Sloan Krause series, The Cure for What Ails You, comes out in September. And I just delivered book 14. And I'm working on a brand new project that's not a mystery. So. Oh, that's exciting. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, we got to look out for that to see how, what comes with that. Yes, yeah, it's still in its early stages, but yeah. so exciting. <laughs> All right. So I think we are pretty much ready to close out our evening. If there, is there anything else that you guys wanted to shout about just real quick before we close down? No, just thanks more to ice cream and read more books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys both for being here. This was such a great conversation. I was over here cackling the whole time and you just <laughs> audience thank you for having us. Of yes. course. My absolute pleasure. Um, everyone in the audience, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I've thrown a whole bunch of links in the chat. So go ahead and follow those over to the website. Go ahead and buy books and please come in. We want to see you. Let us know that you're at this event. Scream. I love it. <laughs> and um, I think that is where we say good night. So thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>